Howdy. Howdy. So as Zach said, my name is David, and I'm going to be talking about evolution and Genesis today, which is a pretty contentious topic, I would say, in sort of modern Christian circles. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So one thing we like to do, if you haven't been here before, is we give difficulty ratings and then like how much Bible are we going to be focusing on today. So today I think we've got intermediate, so not the easiest talk in the world, but also not super difficult. So I'm going to be talking mostly about like systematic theology and then some biblical studies today. So one of the main books I use is this book, Evolution in the Fall. It takes a bunch of scholars who are all experts in like various different fields. So you've got some biologists, you have some ancient Hebrew experts, and they all are writing essays on their field of expertise and writing in dialogue with each other. And then there's a million other things that we're going to be looking at. So we've got some early church fathers. We've got the Summa. We have, of course, St. John Calvin, everyone's favorite saint. And the general challenge that we're looking at is, okay, we have this critical claim. We have this critical scholar understanding of something that seems to be at odds with the Bible. So we have to ask two questions. First, does the critical consensus actually pose a serious challenge? And then if it does, is it likely to be true? And so as we've talked about tonight, I'm going to be asking, does the theory of evolution undermine the authority of the biblical account of origins? All right. So I've got a quote up here. And you have to guess who said it and when. So I'll read it out, and then I want someone out there to guess. Let the waters, it is said, bring forth abundantly moving creatures that have life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Why do the waters give birth also to birds? Because there is, so to say, a family link between the creatures that fly and those that swim. In the same way that fish cut the waters, using their fins to carry them forward and their tails to direct their movements round and round and straight forward, so we see birds float in the air by the help of their wings. Both endowed with the property of swimming, their common derivation from the waters has made them of one family. Any guesses? Darwin. So we've got Darwin. So I don't think Darwin was a Christian. I could be wrong on that. So it would be kind of strange if it was Darwin. But it, it seems like a modern quote, right? It seems like something that would be said after we discovered the evolutionary theory of origins. But actually, this was St. Basil, who lived in the fourth century. And he was a firm young earth creationist. So already, one thing that's important to note here is even though Basil was a firm young earth creationist, there are things that we can learn from him that are still relevant to the issues we're talking about today. So Basil, Basil was a pretty cool guy. We like Basil. All right, here's another one. It is also frequently asked what our belief must be about the form and shape of heaven according to sacred scripture. Many scholars engage in lengthy discussions on these matters. Such subjects are of no profit for those who seek beatitude, and, what is worse, they take up very precious time that ought to be given to what is spiritually beneficial. What concern is it of mine, whether heaven is like a sphere and the earth is enclosed by it and suspended in the middle of the universe? In the matter of the shape of heaven, the sacred writers did not wish to teach men these facts that would be of no avail for their salvation. So... This was Augustine talking about the literal meaning of Genesis. Now, as we're going to see today, this word literal is doing a lot of lifting here, and it means something quite different from what we think of nowadays when we say the word literal, but we'll get more into that in a bit. So there are three main points that we need to think about when it comes to evolution and the Bible. And I've formulated what I think is a reasonably fair summary of these three points. So first, humanity was not created with an inherently sinful nature by God. Oftentimes, 
in the more modern day, we think of this as something quite stronger, which says all creation was perfect, so including us, but not just us, was perfect and without blemish. The world had no imperfections or evils or suffering, including of animals. This is a more modern version of this. You don't see that much in the church fathers. Second, when Adam and Eve, the first humans, ate of the tree of good and evil, humanity fell from union with God. So this is, of course, the fall. And then third, the fall has affected humanity thereafter, making us inherently sinful and inducing a pseudo-ontological shift in our condition. So pseudo-ontological just means like there was a real change in the substance of what it means to be human. So help, we've fallen and, and we, cannot, we cannot get up. All right, so the big question. We, of course, want to believe that the Bible is inerrant. Do we have to deny evolution? And Alvin the Atheist says that Genesis is irreconcilable with evolution. If monkey, no Bible. So what do we do with this? Well, first we need to address whether or not science should be sort of the king of our foundation of, of knowledge. So th there are two things that I want to say here. Here's another quote from Augustine. It not infrequently happens that something about the earth, about the sky, about the passage of years and seasons, about the nature of animals, of fruits, of stones, and of other such things, may be known with the greatest certainty by reasoning or by experience, even by one who is not a Christian. It is too disgraceful and ruinous, though, and greatly to be avoided, that he, the non-Christian, should hear a Christian speaking so idiotically on these matters, and as if in accord with Christian writings, that he might say that he could scarcely keep from laughing when he saw how totally in error they are. So, again, Augustine is writing 1,400 years and change before evolution. So he's not worried about evolution. This is not in response to evolution. This is Augustine writing sometime around 400 saying this. So the thing I want to take away here is God has gifted us with our capacity to reason. He has gifted us with this ability to understand the world and to probe the world and to find out facts about the world. And that should be something that we hold with some weight. That shouldn't just be something that we get to pick and choose which faculties of reason do we want to apply and when do we want to take those results of those reasons. But that doesn't mean that science is going to be the only thing that can give us knowledge. So one of the authors in this book, Evolution and the Fall, says that it is not desirable, it seems to me, to use scientific theories as some sort of epistemological grid through which theological ideas have to pass in order to be acceptable. This concedes far too much to the dominating science status of science in the academy. And she has two PhDs, which is two more PhDs than I have. One of them is in plant physiology, and she also has a PhD in theology. So science is important, I'll get to you in a second, but it's not the only thing that can give us knowledge, okay? So we believe that the Bible is true, and we are completely justified in using the Bible as an additional source of knowledge. It just can't be the only source. Question. Yeah, so epistemology is the study of, like, how do we know things? What justification do we have for knowledge? And so there are various theories of knowledge that we can talk about. But the point here is that she is saying we don't need ideas to have explicit scientific support for us to have grounding for believing them. You can't really do a scientific study to show that Jesus rose from the dead in the same way that you can do a scientific study to show that if I dropped my ring, it would fall on the ground, right? All right, so any other questions before I move on? All right, so we'll go in order here. Was the world perfect? So we've got our two claims here. The first one is sort of the more classical formulation of what we think of as Genesis saying, which is humanity was not created with an inherently sinful nature. 
And then this more modern version that everything was perfect, there was no evil, there was no suffering, there was no death. We think of this as often accompanying that, like, oh, the first humans were just naturally immortal, and then the fall is what caused them to become mortal and to die. Do these claims hold up in the face of evolution? So we've got some literary cues in Genesis. A lot of things get lost when you translate from Hebrew to English, and one of those is that certain words in Hebrew sound very similar, and the author is playing a lot of word games. So, for example, Adam, Adam, just means human and doesn't become a name until Genesis 4. The way you know this is that much as in English, in Hebrew, the does not go before names. So I'm David, but I'm not the David. That would be weird, right? Well, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, it's the Adam, the human. That's not a name for the same reason that I can't say the David in English. It doesn't become a name until Genesis 4. Further, Adam, the human, was made from Adamach, the ground and was made to work the ground. So the word for human and the word for ground sound almost the same, and the author is expecting you to pick up on this resonance. When you say these words, Adam and Adamach, they are similar, they are connected, and they expect you to pick up on that. Some other ones that we miss. Uh, in Genesis 126, the word for subdue so when we are told to subdue the earth, is the same that is used in many warlike passages. So if you go to any of these verses that I've listed, you'll find this word subdue, but it's talking about military conquest. So, for example, the, the Joshua verse is, oh, here's the list of places that Joshua conquered, and it's the same word, okay? So often... We can read this word subdue and think, oh, well, that's just like, oh, we're in charge now. But it has a very strong connotation of you have to go out and work and do something that is difficult, and you're like fighting against something. We should also note that the garden was like a localized thing. You could be in the garden, and you could be not in the garden, which means the garden, this little bubble of perfection, was not the whole earth, right? So a reasonable reading of the charge to fill the earth and subdue it would be to take the land that's outside the garden and turn it into the garden, right? So you're going out and you're conquering all of this land. You are subduing this land. It's just that the way you're doing this is by pulling weeds. So yes, hello, subdue the plants sincerely. God, I guess, in this case. God's not really a zombie, although I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Was the whole world perfect? So we, we got fired, guys. We got fired. You're fired. <laughs> the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. All right, so what does this word keep? Why have I bolded this word? Well, because it's the same word that we find in Genesis 3.24, which says, he drove out the man, we got fired, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So these are the same word. And so what that means is when we say, oh, we have to keep it, well, we're guarding it. So these have like the same, it's the same word. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm guarding something, I have to be guarding against something. It doesn't make sense to say, I'm standing guard. Well, what are you guarding against? What are you worried about? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? So there's something to be done here, something that's imperfect, something that requires work. So again, all of this, all of this that I'm saying is taking place against the backdrop of God saying that it's very good. I'm not saying it wasn't very good. Of course the earth was wonderful. It still is wonderful, even with all of our 
brokenness. But very good does not have to mean that it was perfect and that there was no work to be done. Both of those things can be true. So yeah, as I said, if the humans were charged with guarding or protecting <coughs> the garden, and if we had to go out and conquer the land outside of the garden, then there must have been something to protect against. So the earth was very good, it was wonderful, but it was not paradise in the way that we often think about. So something <laughs> was trying to get at Eden. Doesn't really say what, but Adam and Eve were there to guard against it. So the next point here is pre-fall human death. Were humans dying before the fall? Because Genesis is clear that, like, okay, there's something going on with humans and immortality, right? God tells us, the humans, that when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they shall surely die. We often interpret that in modern-day America and probably the West, that this death just means biologically. This is, of course, untenable under evolution, so what are we supposed to do with that, right? Evolution certainly does not think that humans were immortal at any point. So Genesis doesn't actually say that we were inherently immortal. 3.19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Dust is often used as a metaphor in the Old Testament for like this temporal sense, this we're very like finite. <laughs> we're dust, right? When you think of dust, it's there floating in the air and then it's gone. We're dust. And then three verses later, God is explaining why he has to fire us. And it says, now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Well, the implication there is that if he doesn't eat of the tree of life, then he won't live forever. So actually, Genesis is kind of pointing us towards the conclusion that the first humans were not actually born or created immortal. So literally me. That, there's me. It was, it was a while ago, but that was me. All right, second, of course, when Adam and Eve eat the fruit, they didn't keel over and die. It didn't happen. This confused me when I was younger. I'm sure it confused a lot of you when you were younger as well. That like, God says they're going to die, and then they, they don't die. What, what's, what's up with that? The ancient Hebrews who would have been writing this also would have seen that, right? They wouldn't have just written that in and then be like, eh, whatever. This doesn't bother me at all. They, like, they put that there. They knew, like, they weren't stupid, right? The people who wrote the Bible were not stupid. And so they knew, okay, whatever we're talking about here, God's talking about death is completely compatible with the humans not literally just keeling over and dying. So we are forced to conclude death is not only about physical issues. It is also about the relational aspects between us and God, between each other. If you go and read Genesis 3, the first thing that happens when they eat the fruit is that they stopped trusting each other. They were naked before, and they immediately put on clothing. And there's some other wordplay that I'm happy to get into after the talk there to explain exactly what's going on. But it's quite clear that the death is somehow connected to the fact that their relationship with God and with each other is now broken. And in fact, Jesus talks about this as well. He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. So for Jesus, death is not just the death of the body, but it's also the death of the soul. So, yep, yep. Here's another quote. If they transgressed and turned back, talking about, this is talking about Adam and Eve, and became evil, they might know that they were incurring that corruption in death, which was theirs by nature. No longer to live in paradise, but cast out of it from that time forth to die and to abide in death 
and in corruption. Our modern sensibilities say that, oh, this quote has to be after we figured out evolution, because why would, any, why would anyone say that before evolution? Well, this is St. Athanasius of Alexandria, who was alive in the fourth century and had no idea about evolution or anything else we're worrying about. So I put these kinds of quotes up here to show that this is not just Christianity with post hoc explanations. This is not after the fact we discovered evolution. We've been saying all this for 2,000 years. All we're doing is rediscovering a lot of what the church fathers thought theologically about Adam and Eve and the fall and all of these things. So pre-fall animal death is a theological toss-up. Some of the fathers, Basil, Aquinas, completely fine with animals dying, which is partially because some of them are iffy on whether or not animals have souls. That's a whole other discussion. Augustine and some other guys are not cool. They think animals couldn't have died before the fall. Um, but of course, no death is functionally impossible to hold if you are working under evolution. Evolution requires that animals die and live and keep making new animals <coughs> to actually work, right? But this is OK for the Christian, because animals are definitely not left outside of God's redemptive plan. Isaiah 11 says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. So we can have some peace with the fact that animals were potentially dying for billions of years before we showed up, because they are part of God's plan for all of this too. They're not going to just get left behind. So, question. question. Um, it depends on whether or not the monkey is like conscious in the same way that we are. So, like, you'd have to ask God on that one, I think. All right. So, that I I would I would lean towards this, right? Like, it's not. But in terms of like evolution specifically, there is a question of like, oh, when does when does it become human? Right? Yeah. But we'll get to that here in a second. OK, so let's sum up our points here. We've got our two versions. 1B doesn't look particularly great, but our first statement, our first claim, is essentially just completely untouched by what evolution is talking about. And so we don't have to worry. Everything's great. All right, any questions about this before I move on to the next section? Why did he make you and me? So I think that answers your question, doesn't it? God creates things even though they're not perfect because they can still serve a very good purpose. And part of that if you want conscious creatures to exist is that there are going to be imperfections, but that's more for problem of evil. Yes? Do you think in some way it was, I mean, it's kind of like, it's a difficult question because if you hold God's foreknowledge, in some ways you kind of understand that God made us knowing we would sin and still understood that. So do you think that uh, early on, you know, Eden was kind of more of a perfect, like, paradise place that when they were kicked out of, but do you think that it was kind of, do you think God made Eden intending people to continue in Eden? Or do you think God made Eden knowing they would fall and having a greater plan in store such that maybe he could redeem creatures that were more virtuous through, like, having gone through all of the evil and so forth that happens in the world and having trusted in Jesus and all that versus, like, just Eden people who lived there and never fell? I personally lean towards the latter, 
I personally think it's quite likely that actually a world where we go through all of this junk with sin and with death is ultimately serving the greater good. But, I mean, that, that is a question that you could spend you know, years studying by, it, by itself. Yes. I can try and answer that question after the talk. <laughs> uh, we need to get moving. I am probably behind. <laughs> yeah. All right, so next section. The first humans, question mark. Proposition two, when Adam and Eve, the first humans, ate of the tree of good and evil, humanity fell from union with God. So the biggest problem here, made by evolution, is that Adam and Eve are the first humans. If you take the normal understanding of evolution, like the, the, the first humans doesn't really make sense as a term, right? That's not really something that even refers to anything. So what do we do with that? How should evolution... Okay, yeah, so the question is why does the first humans not make sense as a term? And it's because like, if you have this progressive model of you have monkeys and then you have slightly smarter monkeys and then something happens and then eventually you get to us, there's no like, obvious hard cutoff point where, oh, everything on this side of the line is a monkey and everything on this side of the line is a human. So we have to find an answer to that and we're gonna look at some different models for answering this question. So, the pre-modern church was universal in its understanding that Adam and Eve were real historical figures. While the person of Adam is obviously veiled in mystery, in a mythical re-narration of the proto-history given in the first chapters of Genesis, he's very wordy, I'll explain these words in a second. Nevertheless, none of the fathers, scholastics, or reformers thought of him as simply a metaphor or parable. So, mythical re-narration of the proto-history given. He doesn't mean myth in the sense of untrue. He means myth in the sense of, and especially with proto-history, it's like, it's beyond history. Myths can still be true, right? There are a lot of true myths. Um, and like, even with Achilles, it was likely that Achilles was a real historical person, even if the Iliad and the Odyssey may not be precisely history. He was probably a person that existed that that was based on. So he's not saying Adam is just a myth that we should believe to be true, because the fathers, the scholastics, reformers, all thought that he was a real historical person. All right, so should we believe that it's just an allegory? Well, there are some things that might point that way, because in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the names for Adam and Eve just mean human and life. So again, even, even calling it names is kind of misleading because they don't become names until Genesis 4. So you have the human and life, and they're just these two people. They're not names, per se. And so, like, if you have human and life, and, like, if you imagine Genesis 1 through 3, and every time you see Adam or Eve, you replace it with human and life, suddenly it reads like it could be an allegory, right? This scholar, J. Richard Middleton, he's an expert on ancient Hebrew. He says that we seem to be justified in viewing Adam both as the first human, because, again, the fathers and the scholastics all thought that he was a real person, and conceiving of him archetypally as every man or everyone. So we can do both of these, right? We can think of him as a real person and also understand this story 
as like a lens to view our own lives through. Another important thing to note here is that Genesis actually gives causal power to the earth. 24 and 25 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth. So the earth is the thing doing the action. Bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth. So the earth here is responsible for the creation of the animals of all of the different kinds. So it's not just God saying, oh, I want to make animals. And then there's animals. He says, let the earth do it. I'm going to let the earth do this. This same term is also used in Genesis 1.12, which is talking about the plants and all of the vegetation. That's interesting. So here's a mole, which I'm pretty sure is Michael's fault because Michael's the kind of person who would like moles as animals. So, yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so ontological resonance. I like my big words. What do these big words mean, David? Well, in Genesis 2.19, we are told that God also made the beasts and the birds out of the ground, out of the Adama. So we've got Adam and Adama, right? We have these words sounding the same. The beasts and the birds are made out of the same stuff as we are. They are made out of the dirt, just like we were made out of the dirt. So this is compounded further. We have this sort of connection, this resonance. So ontology here is like, okay, what is the fundamental stuff of things? So like, obviously, a rock is different ontologically. It's a different kind of thing than I am, right? Same thing with this water bottle. This water bottle and me are not the same kind of thing. There's resonance here, and it's at the level of ontology, what are we, that we're related to the beasts and the birds. Okay. Adam then goes and names all of the animals, which was a sign of dominion and intimacy. So he's very, very connected with the animals. And so it's clear that the biblical authors viewed humans and animals as deeply interrelated. Our role is to subdue the earth, and have dominion over it, and that includes creating spaces for animals in the world. So there's Zach with his best boy doggo or best girl doggo. I don't, I don't know the gender of the dog. It's a girl. I didn't put it there. That's someone in the back. So don't yell at me. Don't fire me, please. All right, so here's this quote from Middleton. Throughout this entire storyline, the oral resonance, so that's ears, sound, of human and ground, along with the narrated contours of their interdependence, suggests that humans are fundamentally earth creatures or groundlings. This, together with the fact that the animals are also taken from the ground, may be helpful in thinking about how the picture of humanity in Genesis 2 might relate to what we know of human and animal origins from evolutionary history. Another thing that we miss, because we live in 2000 AD and change, is that Genesis 1 through 3 is depicting the garden as a temple. <coughs> when God casts out Adam and Eve, he sets the guardians in front of the east, which would have been the direction that you entered a temple from in ancient times. So if you lived in the ancient Near East, and you went to a temple, the entrance to the temple was always facing the east. So various other ancient Near Eastern texts also make use of garden imagery when they're talking about temples. So you'll go read some random Babylonian thing, and it'll be talking about, oh, here's this temple, and oh yeah, by the way, it's a garden. Question? Uh, just that general area. So. Jewish temples, yes, but not just Jewish. So like Assyrian temples, Babylonian temples, probably Egyptian temples, all would have been facing the east as an entrance. So if you go pick up a random Babylonian text and it's talking about, oh, we have this temple, the, the entrance is from the east. So if you go walk around ancient Babylon, all of the temples will face the east. Yeah, 
And so, in fact, as Zach noted, the, the ancient churches continued this practice. So if you go find <coughs> some of the earliest churches, they still open to the east. The entrance is always facing the east. So, temple, Babylon free zone, which is kind of spoilers for the rest of the Bible, but that's okay. Hopefully no one is being spoiled about the Bible in this talk. Other people. Where are the other people? That's kind of weird. When we get to Genesis 4, Cain is walking around after murdering his brother, slight oopsie. He's afraid of people. He's able to marry them, which we know some people who might do that. Right? Sweet home Alabama. Love it when I have to explain the joke. Great job, guys. Okay, so if we, if we think about this, like, the people just show up. They didn't come from anywhere. They're, the Bible is just like, yeah, he was f- afraid of some people. And you're supposed to be going, what people? W- what people? Other people? What are you talking about? Where did this come from? Right? It doesn't tell us. It's just implied. At some point, other people showed up. Okay, so what do we do with all this? I've given you a bunch of facts. Let's look at our Proposition 2 again. When Adam and Eve, the first humans, ate of the tree of good and evil, humanity fell from union with God. It seems difficult to affirm based on purely scientific grounds. So this goes back to that is science king thing that I was talking about, purely scientific grounds. If we passed everything that we believe through science, science has to check off, it would be hard for us to say that Adam and Eve are the first humans. But we don't have to do that. We don't have to let science tell us what we can and can't believe. Science should affect it, but it's not the only way for us to know things. So we still have several options for believing this. We can still just affirm that Adam and Eve were truly the first humans and embrace a little mystery, it's pretty unlikely that we're going to find, (laughs) like, oh, no one is going to find, like, skeletons one day that prove this one way or the other, right? That's just not going to (coughs) happen. So it's perfectly valid to say, look, we have other good reasons for believing in Scripture and for believing the truth of Scripture. Scripture says they were the first humans, so they were the first humans. That's totally fine. So William Lane Craig defends this. And of course, like, we deal with bigger mysteries as Christians all the time. We believe that God became a human. That, to me, is far more difficult to believe in terms of just how strange it is than that, oh, well, you know, Adam and Eve, they were still the first humans. Like, th- th- this is small stuff in comparison. Second option is that Adam and Eve were picked by God out of some group of humans to be the first priests or representatives of humanity. This comes from the fact that we're seeing a lot of this temple imagery, right? So if you think of the garden as the first temple, then it would make sense that Adam and Eve would be the first priests. Finally, we can go full into the literary representation route. This is what a lot of modern Jewish theology will do. They will just go full in and say, yeah, Adam and Eve weren't historical people. This is a literary device that the Bible is using to talk about human nature in general. I am much more partial to the first two or some combination thereof because I do think that you run into problems with this last one. Uh, because of church history, because we have 1,800 years, essentially, of Christian thinkers saying, yeah, these were real people, and they were the first of some kind. So I lean towards the first two, but I think there are probably models where you can make the third one work. So any questions on this section?
Yeah. So I guess my question to you is, how does this attack any similarities? Because it seems like some of those are old reports from this year. So I'm going to preface my answer by saying that, like, I have not thought about this question extensively, so I'm going to give a shot at it. But like, I'm sure someone out there has given a better answer than me. Um, but my thought would be, OK, well, if something like this happened, then it's not at all surprising that other cultures have similar stories. right? Just like with the flood, we find that <laughs> basically every human culture has some sort of flood story. So something's going on there where, OK, it's likely that some sort of flood happened and that this is like just buried into the cultural awareness of every people group on, on the Earth. So in a similar way, it's not particularly surprising to me that Norse culture, Babylonian culture, the Zoroastrians probably have similar creation stories. As to the age, well, I don't think other accounts being written first means that they're correct, right? Like, that, that seems like a weird thing to assume, at least. And so, like, it, it's, that question almost comes down to, well, why did God, why did Jesus show up when he did? It's like a similar question, right? Why did God choose for the account of human creation, the creation of the world, to be written when it was? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's a God thing, not a me thing. Any other questions? Yes. So I guess with respect to like, OK, we're evaluating all of these and whether or not the critical scholars either, you know, if we have to take it that way or have other options or if they just have it wrong. But it seems like in here, the fall idea is, if you take one, like maybe the second example for, you know, in Genesis mm -hmm. 1, you say, OK, there's this representative. How do you still have this fall of union from God? Or is that, I mean, that might be too deep a question to go into. That is the next section. <laughs> what a perfect segue. Thank you, Katie. It's time for original sin, everyone's favorite topic. All right, original sin, what do we do? The fall, Proposition 3, has affected humanity thereafter, making us inherently sinful and inducing a pseudo-ontological shift in our condition. I think on the handout, we changed the language a little. It says, inducing a real change in our human nature. So those are the same thing. Evolution seems to say that humans were sinful and violent for like 100 millennia before we would get to Adam and Eve. That seems like a problem if Adam and Eve were where the fall started to happen. So what do we do with this? What should we do? There's two ideas here, concupiscence versus guilt, when we're talking about original sin. Concupiscence says that all humans are driven towards sin and have broken desires. Non passe non care, right? So it, I'm being made fun of by someone who edited my slides here. Latin makes me sound smarter. Yes, <laughs> using Latin automatically gives you plus 10 IQ at the cost of you sound really pretentious, right? So. You know, I think it's a fair trade-off, but to each their own. <laughs> and are therefore guilty of their own actions. So that's concupiscence. We are guilty of our problems, and we're all broken. Original guilt says that all of humanity is guilty of Adam's sin, not just our own. So a common idea that you find in proponents of original guilt is that this guilt and this this sort of inherent brokenness and inclination towards sin is something that is biologically passed on. So it's something in our DNA. And that seems hard to say if we believe that, oh, well, we're just this like unbroken chain of evolutionary history where there's like there's not this sudden massive jump in our DNA where, oh, well, now we're broken, and now we have wars, and now we kill people. So what do we do with this? So original guilt, this is Augustine. This is our boy Augustine. He was the progenitor of this view. 
which says that all humans are guilty of Adam's sin. He thought that sin nature was biologically imputed, and he gets this from Romans 5, which says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, in whom all sinned, in bold. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. That, that sounds like original guilt, right? It says we all sinned through Adam. So, original guilt, that that's, seems reasonable, right? Here's the problem. <laughs> Romans doesn't say that. Augustine was terrible at Greek. And so, when he read the Latin translation of the Greek text, he interpreted the Latin, which was ambiguous, as saying, in whom all sinned. But in the Greek, it says, death spread to all men because all sinned. So we did not sin in Adam. We sinned because we sinned. That's where it stops, right? We are guilty because we sinned. It has nothing to do with Adam's sin. So, if Augustine knew how to read Greek, he may never have made this mistake, which probably would have been good, but what can you do? Okay, so, original guilt, faulty exegesis. What does evolution have to say about original sin? Well, we don't have any issue with reconciling other statements in the Bible that are at odds with, like, science, right? The Bible very clearly believes that the earth is a disk and we are in a three-tiered cosmology where you have, like, earth in the middle and then you have heaven, that's where God is and that's above us, and then if you're a bad and, like, <coughs> hell, that's under you. We don't have any issue with saying, well, okay, look, the biblical authors were expressing the cultural background that they lived in. They were not defending it. These were all just tacit assumptions that they made. They weren't going out to say, look, yes, the earth is flat, and I'm going to prove it to you today. It was just everyone thought the world was flat back then. And so one example here, 2 Peter 3, for they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago. Okay, good. And the earth was formed out of water. Mm, we don't think that anymore, but that's completely fine. Because 2 Peter 3 is not about science. 2 Peter 3 is about something completely different. It's not saying, oh, you have to believe this. This is just what people thought back then. It is expressing their cultural background, but it's not defending it. So, if we apply a similar logic, all concupiscence claims is that humans are inherently bent towards sin. This is one of the, like, the least controversial propositions in all of Christendom. Humans are broken. <laughs> humans have problems. I, I, I don't really think I need to defend that very hard. I think it's quite obvious that we are guilty of not being perfect people. You are not able to not sin. That's what the Latin means. Plus 10 IQ, minus 2 pretension. Even if Adam was not the literal first human... We can still e easily believe that humans descended from a state of goodness into a state where we cannot help but sin. So this is actually what the Bible shows. Genesis 1 through 11 is a gradual descent. We think of it often as like this momentary, immediate change. But if you go and read Genesis 1 through 11, it's a gradual thing. We start with Adam and Eve who make the mistake of eating from the tree, but they don't, like, kill anyone. And then the next generation, we have Cain, who kills his brother, but then Cain is like, oh, my God, what did I do? And then you keep going, and then you get to Lamech, who is over there bragging in Genesis 4 or 5, probably 5. He's over there bragging about, mm, yes, look at me. I murdered someone because he insulted me in the street. I am very cool. And it keeps going and going, and God's like, okay, time to flood everything, because this is bad. And then you get the Tower of Babel, which is like the ultimate expression of humanity's brokenness. They're trying to become God. They're building a tower to the heavens. All right? Question. So if Adam was not the first human, presumably he wouldn't be the only human. And so why would him sin and the original sin be those who 
Right, so this is why like, we can't really hold to this biological view of original guilt. But if you, like, original sin in terms of concupiscence is just born out of the fact that, like, the moment you come into the world, you're coming to a sinful world. You're surrounded by sin. Your culture is sinful. Your parents are sinful. Your peers are sinful. It is impossible for you because of the context that you live in to not sin. And so what the Bible actually portrays is pretty consistent here with this idea, which is just saying, okay, look, the humans made this mistake, and the mistake just got worse and worse and worse until God was like, all right, this is bad. I got, I got to do something. I got to do something about this. So does that kind of answer your question? Okay. All right. So... Yes. So, wouldn't that suggest that humans should have sinned before Adam? Weren't they? So they were in the they were in the garden, the temple. They didn't follow the fact the belief that they were people, right? Represented yeah. for God. And they were talking to God for these things. Wouldn't that suggest that they needed people? Not necessarily. Like, if you're, I don't know, this is off the top of my head analogy. If you have a five-year-old child and you take them to the doctor, the adult in the room has to, like, intercede between the doctor and the child, right? Because the five-year-old is not prepared to sit there and understand all of these things that need to happen. But that doesn't mean the child did anything wrong. It just means you're five. You're not prepared, mentally, spiritually, whatever, to talk about these things. So it, it, it could be that when you know, Adam and Eve became the first priest, part of that was God giving them some sort of like higher faculties, right? This was a common thought in the church fathers that the way in which we reflect God that is different from the animals is that we're rational, right? And so it could be the case that when Adam and Eve became the first priests, part of what was happening there is that was God bestowing this gift of rationality and of self-awareness onto them. And so they may have been the first humans in that sense where, okay, they're not necessarily like the first humans biologically, but they're the first humans insofar as they are the first people to be people, right? Does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So let's summarize. Augustine was bad at Greek, all right, unfortunate. A primary focus for original sin is the broken social conditions we are born into. So regardless of whether they were the first humans, the doctrine of concupiscence, of the fact that we are broken and continue to be broken and can't not be broken, has just not been touched at all. Question, quickly. Yes. What was the Eastern Church yeah, the, the Eastern Church was saying this. Like, the, the Eastern Church had nothing to do with what Augustine was doing and it was just <coughs> completely foreign to them as an idea. So, it's not just, oh, Augustine is bad, but like everyone believed Augustine. No, the entire Eastern Church had nothing to do with this set of ideas about original guilt. So, I got to wrap up. Here's our summary. Evolution, while it requires some shifts, it's not anywhere near as drastic as it might seem like on the surface. Evolution points us to some things that we've actually forgotten in our history. There's a lot of truths about our relation to the world, our relation to animals, that we have forgotten post-enlightenment. Shout out to the enlightenment. More like the endarkening, but anyway. Um, including focusing on the communal aspects of sin much more heavily. So thinking about sin as this corporate thing that, oh, sin is our social conditions. It's the fact that we're all broken and we're born into things that are broken. A major point that does need to be explored more is what did Paul actually believe about Adam and Eve? 
Did he think they were the first humans? If he thought they were the first humans, what do we do with that? How does that interact with our understanding of biology? So, any questions, which would probably have to be answered out there? Yep, um, we're right at 9.30, so let's thank David for his time real quick. All right.